Hey there, welcome to this episode of More Than Money on All About Your Benjamins, the podcast. Today, I'm excited to introduce you to my friend, Elliot Apple. And from his bio in the book, you can check out Elliot's chapter beginning on page 205 called Living Today, Planning for Tomorrow. Elliot Apple is a fee-only financial planner. He's the founder of Kindness Financial Planning, which focuses on helping widows, caregivers, and people affected by major health events gain control over their financial life. In addition to writing regularly about financial planning strategies, aging issues, and caregiving, Elliot hosts a podcast called Making the Most of Time. He's been quoted the Wall Street Journal, Associated Press, and many other publications. Elliot is a member of the National Association of Personal Financial Advisors, aka NAPFA, and the XY Planning Network. He currently lives in Madison, Wisconsin to support his wife's career in medicine, but he calls the Pacific Northwest home. So allow me to introduce you to Elliot Apple and to his chapter, Living Today, Planning for Tomorrow. I hope you enjoy this conversation, and we'll see you all in the next episode. All right, so Elliot, you know, of all of the stories that you could have chosen from your career as a financial advisor, which how many years have you been an advisor now? About 10 years in the industry. Okay. okay, so 10 years in the industry, countless client experiences. What was it about the one that you chose um, for the book that was kind of the one for you to tell? Yeah, so this one is the one that really jumped out at me when we said we had one story to tell. This was the first one that came to mind. And so I didn't really have a good reason that came off the bat. But, you know, thinking back on it now, I think it's one where we got to put a lot of preventative measures in place. We got to do a lot of planning before sort of the bad things happened without revealing too much of my story. But we we got to go through the financial planning process and there was more of a beginning, middle and end as opposed to sometimes when we meet with folks, it's in the middle of something that's going wrong or it's after something had gone wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because usually most people seek a financial advisor when there's a financial stress, like very few people reach out to us before that stress comes. Uh, It makes me think of a quote that my mentor Josh Brown said on a podcast that you can't force somebody to want a financial advisor. Um, you can only be top of mind when the time comes, which is what we experience most of the time. So to have a story that highlights the beginning, middle, and the end and showing why it's so important is is pretty cool. I have to admit, your first sentence really grabbed me. Um, without giving a whole lot away, the, the name for the client, because we, I mean, we made sure everybody's identity was protected in the book, but it was Leo. And I'm not going to ruin the first line, but that caught my, my eye really quick and I was like, oh, so it, it pulled me in. Um, how much, in hindsight, how much of this story do you think jumped out to you because of your experience with your dad? I mean, you're very vocal and talk a lot about the, your, the personal experiences you're going on through now and through the process. Do you think some of like that connection was why this story is so special to you? Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't even say some of it. I'd say almost all of it. I mean, there's different experiences here, but um, same disease that was going on and similar experiences with what they were going through and what I was going through it. um, Yeah, it resonated with me. Okay. Well, um, without giving away the chapter in this, your chapter is called Living Today, Planning for Tomorrow. So I will will give the title away. Um, What's the main message you hope readers take away from your your contribution? I think we all come from a place that as our life looks today, it will look like in the future. We sort of assume that as the default and things won't change quickly. And I hope people will take away that the life that we have today is not promised tomorrow. It's not promised 10 years from now. And so the more that you can plan to get things in place and prepare things for those around you, uh, the, the better life will be when life inevitably does end up happening to you. So since this is kind of an area of your focus and you know important to you, how do you help clients figure that out? My experience has been like a lot of people don't know what they want. They, they don't know what they truly want. So if we're trying to help our clients prepare for the future because we don't know what's going to happen and create lives that they really want to live, like what's been your experience as ways to help people? So somebody watching this or reading the book or listening, how can they really start to dig deep and figure out what they really want so they really know what they're planning for? Yeah. So for me, I'm a huge fan of life planning. So for those who aren't familiar, the Kinder Institute teaches a certain method of life planning. um, And they have a series of three meetings that sort of help you discover what's important to you, narrow it down a little bit more, 
And then you talk about obstacles and what could possibly get in the way and just holding that space and trying to figure out what it is you want going forward. And I, we like to say, what, what is it that's in your ideal life going mm-hmm. forward? Mm-hmm. And I like framing it that way because it's not a perfect life. It's not, you know, an okay life. It's what's in your ideal life. And just going through that process, they have some questions, the kinder three questions. You could do those on your own or have someone say them to you. That's really impactful versus doing it on your own. Mm-hmm. And going through that process because it's it's a discovery process. How often do we actually spend time thinking about what I, we want our life to look like? Mm-hmm. For people not familiar with Kinder, maybe to hook them in, because I, I I don't have the RLP, so that's the I think it's Registered Life Planner designation. But I intend on doing it in twenty twenty four. Um, I do believe in it. I've had Kinder on the, my podcast in the past. But for those not familiar with it. Can you real quickly share those three questions or summarize those three questions for them? Yeah, let's see if I can do this from memory. I usually have the sheet with me, but um, it, hmm. I want to get the questions right. So I'm going to, I'm going to look down here as we do this, but. Um, and and, I, and so while Elliot finds the questions, because he didn't know this was coming, um, I, I sent everybody five questions. This is not a part of it. Um, this is what a real financial advisor looks like. You know, financial advisors are supposed to be, the, supposed, we're supposed to have the answers. That's what we think and believe, and I think that's the perspective. But a real financial advisor will say, hey, you know what? I'm not quite sure. Hang on one second. Let me look that up. You know, I don't know, but let me get back to you. So even though you use these all the time, I don't expect you to know. You're not George Kinder. You didn't come up with these. So that is what real financial advisors look like. They're not afraid to say, you know what? Let me check my resources real quick to make sure I get this right so I don't lead you astray. So hopefully they yeah. gave you time to find a, the, the it questions. It did. I've got them here. Um, and I'll, I'll paraphrase a little bit, but I, I wanted to be reminded of some of the language that's in here mm-hmm. because I think the way that the framing is is super important. But so for the first one, thinking about your ideal life, I want you to ma- imagine that you're financially secure. You have enough money to take care of your needs now and in the future. How would you live your life? What would you do? Would you change anything? Let yourself go. Don't hold back on your dreams. Describe a life that is completely yours. That's a powerful exercise too. Like I, I, I didn't, I didn't do an ideal. Well, I've, I've done my ideal life, but I did ideal day. So if you just want like an introduction to how powerful these types of questions can be, I planned out my ideal day, and it took a while, but it it made me make drastic changes to my professional life because I realized this day I described I actually had there was just an obstacle I needed to remove, and I did it. And it just changed my life for the better. So, you know, it sounds like a very simple question, but if you actually put a lot of thought to it, it could lead you down a different path, which is what's beautiful about life planning to where you drastically change the life that you're living to create the life that you really want. I'm coining the, the phrase authentic life, um, but I, I, I love that I love first it. question. All right, what's, what's, that, what's next? The second question. So this time you visit your doctor and your doctor tells you you have five, ten, five to 10 years to live. The good part is... You will never feel sick. You won't hurt. The bad news is you'll have no notice of the moment of your death. You don't know when it's coming. What will you do in the time that you have remaining to live? What will you change in your life and how will you do it? Mortality, man. Mortality is one that will really get you focused on what's most important. And then this is where we'll show behind the scenes and kind of like how advisors think. Whatever you answer to that question, if that's not a part of your current plan and not what you're doing, like that's where the area of focus goes. You know, if you know, if I only had this, I would be doing this. Well, why aren't you doing it today? Well, X, Y, and Z. Well, we can work through X, Y, and Z so you can do that today, and then ultimately, hopefully, create a life that minimizes the regret that you may have. Um, number three, what you got? Yeah. So for number three now, this time. Your doctor shocks you with the news that you have one day left to live. Notice what feelings arise in you as you confront your very rare mortality. Ask yourself, what did I not get to do? Who did I not get to be? And the reality of it is, like, we we hear that question, and it just seems like it's an exercise. But the truth is, like, that could be every day for every single one of us. Like, we don't know. And one day that that question will be true, um, and I like that question because I, when I first started asking my version of it um, in my meetings, 
people would assume I was going to say, what do you do in your last 24 hours? And that's a good question, but I don't like that doesn't change what it is you're doing today. No. But you know, who did you not become? What did you not get to do? Like, what were the events that you, you wish you could go back and change? Great. Good news is you didn't get that diagnosis today. So if you get that diagnosis in a year, a week, 10, 20 years, like how do we avoid you having those feelings in the future? And I think it takes, I won't say it takes a special person, but it takes somebody who is serious about adjusting their life to go through this exercise. Because it's one thing to say these things, but it's going to cause, for most people, it's going to cause a change and sacrifice and adjustments. But if you realizing today's your last day and you would regret not doing this, to me, that'd be pretty important that I would change almost anything to do that. So I think those are, are great, great questions. And I appreciate you taking us on that path real quick and, and sharing it with us when you didn't know that was coming. Um, yeah. And I, the other thing I want to just mention, Justin, before we wrap up that conversation is mm -hmm. there's some inspirational exercises that go in between these and through those series of meetings. And those are really important because you get some time to think on your own, not mm -hmm. necessarily with a planning partner, but then we get to come back and talk about those things. And what I like about this process is you create your own energy doing this. So you talked about, you know, you have to find someone who's serious to do this. Oftentimes when you're working with people, they get excited about this really excited to make these changes. And I've worked with people who then come back and will say something along the lines of, you know, I did this, 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 and this. And there's so much change that have happened since the last time we talked. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing is they get excited, but I just saw you get excited just thinking about replaying some of those scenarios in you. Again, like this is not, this is why I'm so excited about the book. I got to flash the book so everybody can see it. And, you know, one, it's to get great advisors like you and, and get the spotlight shine on you so more people can find advisors like you and find you and you get the do jo uh, the, the just do's that you deserve. But also, like, this is what a lot of advisors are doing that people don't know about. Like, this is not the stereotypical financial advisor relationship or, you know, you're not in a suit, you know, you got a keyboard in the background. Like, that's not the stereotype and that's what, the, you know, I hope the book breaks that, which leads me to my next question. You can tell I host a podcast, like, I'm actually proud of that setup. So <laughs> what is one misconception about financial advisors that you would like to clear up? Whether that's tied to your story or just anything in general, you have a platform to say, hey, everybody, you might think financial advisors are this way, but the truth is, like, what would that be? You kind of just answered it for me, Justin, in a way, because I, I was, I was going to say, we're, we're not all bad. It's not all about money and technical jargon. Our industry gets a bad rap, and for good reason, a lot mm -hmm. of the time. Um, I'll be 100% uh, transparent and honest with that, but it, we're, not, we're not all that way. And I think that's really important because that's usually what gets in the news is that method of working with people. And I think you know, this episode, through your story that you chose to share, your words today, and then going through Kinder's questions and what that looks like in a planning process just, just kind of shows that. All right, so kind of a fun question, not to do with the book. Um, I think it's fun for advisors to be vulnerable and, and share different things. Um, so we're going to go on an optimistic side. I, I could have gone, what's your worst financial decision? And, and maybe I should throw that in there. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna, let's do best first, and then we're going to be vulnerable, and we're going to share our worst because I want people to see that we are humans, and we make bad financial decisions as well. So I'm an optimistic person. What's the best financial decision you've ever made? I struggled with this question. I'm mm -hmm. still not maybe even 70% confident in my answer, but um, I think there are pros and cons to this answer, but here's what I'll say. I think saving a lot of money and focusing on earning a high income in my 20s and saving a lot of that was very helpful because it's allowed me now in my 30s to take more career risks. It allowed me to quit my job to design a, a practice that I'm excited about to move across the country to um, work around my wife's schedule. And so I, I think saving a lot of money and making some sacrifices in my 20s was potentially the best financial decision. Again, I'm not 100% confident in this answer, but it's the one that came to mind. Do you have a runner up that kind of makes you not so sure that's the right one? And if not, that's okay. I, you know, I don't, I don't know yet. I, you know, I think getting married probably to mm -hmm. my wife and just having a life partner is going to be a phenomenal life decision, but that's mm -hmm. still fresh. Okay. That's fair. That's fair. So flip side, what is the worst financial decision you've made? Worst financial decision. 
I'll give you one or two, okay. two, because I'm not sure. Um, the two that stand out. I, in hindsight, I probably could have gone to a cheaper college. I went to a private university, had some scholarships. So when I think back on it and the amount that was spent on education, I, you know, I don't regret it, but I think I would have had a equally good time at a public school somewhere mm-hmm. in college, um, and it would have cost far less. Mm-hmm. So that's one. I also, I, I have quite a bit of cash on hand. That's mm-hmm. my nature is I have cash for emergencies. And when I talk about taking career risks and that sort of thing, the reason I was able to do that is because I had cash on hand. And I'm a financial planner. I know the math. Mm-hmm. I know that doesn't work well for me long term. And economically, it's made me worse off. So from a purely economic decision, one of the worst financial decisions. But from an emotional decision, which I often talk about emotional versus economic, it's been a great emotional decision. That brings up my favorite financial quote. I wish I would have coined it. Tim Maurer coined it. Personal finance is more personal than finance. And your story right there makes me think about you know, Morgan Housel, the author of The Psychology of Money, like probably like the greatest financial book written of the, the last decade or so, if not more. He came to the community and spoke. And he, kinda, he, he said Tim's quote, and he shared that his best – he framed it as his best – financial decision was his worst money decision. I think that's, I have it right, or flip-flop. Mm-hmm. But it was something similar to yours. It was paying off his mortgage at a relatively young age. And he said, you know, I were, I, I, I'm in finance. I understand the spreadsheets. I talk to all the smartest finance people out there. And I understand what my money could be doing for me. But the peace of mind of knowing that our house is paid off is worth more to me and my wife than the potential returns that I could have earned on that money. And then he went into, you know, I'm going to save those mortgage payments now and invest them in over 20 years. Maybe I have a little bit less, but I felt more comfortable with it. And I think that's really important and a good takeaway of not only is the conversation that you're, you're having with clients and in the story you're having personalized, but then how you, a real financial advisor structures a recommendation and builds a plan should be one part spreadsheet and one part emotional to you, the client of what, what works best. Because what I always tell people is I could create the perfect spreadsheet financial plan. You'll be a billionaire if you follow this plan. But if it doesn't align with your values and you never actually stick to it, then it's not really a plan and we don't get anywhere. So if mm-hmm. I create a plan that you only like, – let's say you die with you know, $750,000. like that, That's a decent amount of money to have at the end of your lifetime. But you did everything you wanted to do. You did it in a way that aligned with your values and what's important to you. You don't have any, you have minimal regrets on the way out. What's a better plan? The one with a billion dollars or the one where you did all the things you wanted to do your way and you didn't run out of money? My take is exactly. it's, it's the second one, but who am I to tell you what's right for you? So um, I love that. I love your story of um, what your worst money decisions were. And I'm like you, I went to a private school as well. And I look back and like, I don't, there's nothing against Franklin College. I love Franklin College, but I can't look back and say that that higher tuition was worth worth it and that I'm that much better off because of it. Um, and I hate to say that, but th- that's the truth. And I think that we're seeing education's potentially going to be changing going forward because of that. So, yeah. all right, Elliot, final question. I've been dragging this out to get us closer to 30 minutes and keeping you going. You're doing a great job. Um <laughs> What was the, what's the reason that you decided to participate in this project? Because a lot of work went into this, um, writing, revising it, um, you know, you're, you're working, you're a husband, you've got other things you want to do. What made you want to participate in this project? Yeah. So selfishly, I've always wanted to have a published book. Um, and when we started this project, I thought it would be self-published, which would be great. I just, I wanted for whatever reason, vanity metrics, ego, whatever we're talking about, this was just been a It's on my bucket list. When Mm -hmm. we talk about our ideal life, having a published book out there was on it. And so that's why I wanted to participate. I think it's great. We're sharing your story. We're raising money for charity, um, all great things. But honestly, selfishly, it was, hey, I want to get a published book. And then when I found out this was actually getting picked up by a publisher, I was like, okay, extra check mark there on my ideal life. Well, and I I appreciate, and I appreciate the honesty and there's nothing wrong with that. Like I, I, like we shouldn't apologize because, you know, we, we know Ryan Holiday says ego is the enemy. And this is something I've been thinking about. But, like, there's nothing wrong with wanting to accomplish something like that. I don't think it's necessarily a vanity. And the good thing is, like, your chapter can, is a part of a you know, compilation of all these great stories centered around what real financial planning looks like 
to help people, one, figure out that maybe they, they could use help. Maybe they see themselves in a similar story to realize that they're not alone. And maybe it leads somebody to go find a real financial planner like yourself um, to get the help that they need. So I think that like your first book, because it probably won't be your last one, is, uh, is you know it's a good contribution to a good cause. And as you mentioned, all of the proceeds on the AGC side of things are going to um, BLX and the Foundation for Financial Planning and other organizations within our profession. It wasn't about Elliot or myself or anybody in the community making money. It was about getting these stories out there, helping our advisors be found, showing people what real financial planning looks like. And then, you know, if we're lucky enough to sell a bunch of books, then helping the profession move forward. So I think it was a worthy cause. Your chapter was great. Um, again, your first sentence really grabbed me. So if you, if you don't have the book, go order it. And then when you read it and you know that I have a Leo in my family, it would make a lot more sense. Um, so, Elliot, I want to um, thank you for taking some time to share your story, um, why you chose your story, and a little bit more about planning and the way you approach it. Um, I think it was a great episode. I'm really glad that you took the time. So, appreciate it. Again, um, Elliot's chapter is towards the back of the book. I think it's on page 205. It is 205, Living Today, Planning for Tomorrow. Um, so, make sure you check that chapter out and go find Elliot out on Twitter or where else could they find you if they want to give you feedback on your chapter. Uh, you can go to my website. I have a contact form on there if you want to, kindnessfp.com. Okay, awesome. Let Elliot know what you thought about the chapter, any feedback, um, and uh, that's it. So, Elliot, thanks again. Everybody watching and listening, thanks for tuning in. If you don't have your copy of More Than Money, uh, what are you waiting for? Go out there. It's at Amazon and all the places you can order it. Um, support the advisors in the, in the book. Um, support the organizations that we are supporting because, again, all the proceeds go to financial planning-related organizations. And with that, I will let you all get your day. Thank you very much, and we'll see you all in the next episode. Thanks, Justin.